Praise God. Hallelujah. Today, I am going to speak on a topic I titled, Inheriting the Kingdom of God. What can we do to inherit the Kingdom of God? Praise God. And I'm going to make this in parts. So, this is the part one. I'm going to make it break it into parts so that all the um, uh, social media channels will have the full message. So good news to those of you on, on TikTok. This is the part one. I'm going to be posting the part two and hopefully maybe the part three or just part one and part two depending on how the spirit leads. And I'm going to post full video on, on YouTube. I'm not going to make parts on YouTube. Uh, because YouTube can contain up to 20 minutes, any amount of minutes you want, but we want to break it into 10 minutes on other social media platform. Uh, praise God, like Instagram and uh, TikTok. So, what do you need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And uh, you know, I've, I've made this comment before that you'll be surprised when you see most of the celebrities most celebrities you taught are not heaven bound most of them you thought are the worst sinners you may be surprised to see them in heaven you may be surprised to see them in heaven because one thing God didn't tell us is a perimeter he will use to judge God is a righteous judge he's a just judge the perimeter he will use to judge most of you are Christians thinking that Christianity is your religion by shouting Jesus, 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 you know, you are saved. It's a good thing. It's only in that name of Jesus that you can be saved. But what we fail to understand or comprehend the fact is that Christianity is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. It means once you are a Christian, you are emulating the lifestyle of your mentor. We are mentees of Jesus, and Jesus expected us to emulate his, his lifestyle. And uh, that lifestyle of Christ is what will take you to the kingdom of God. You don't, no, nothing else. Jesus said it. And I'm going to use three scriptural verses to buttress my point because I want us to understand that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God if you don't emulate the lifestyle of Christ. Christianity is not a religion. The Bible made us to understand there is only one true religion, only one true religion that God sanctions us to practice. And that religion is just uh, Christ's lifestyle. And it's in James chapter 1 verse 27. You know, I try to speak to us under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Whenever I speak, I receive an unction to speak. You know, and uh, I try to speak under looted word of God, because there is a there is a, a stage in life you will get, a stage you will get in this life. You will desire for nothing else but to be at peace with Christ. There is a stage you will get in this world. If you haven't gotten to that stage, you are a fool. If you haven't gotten to a stage that you want to be at peace with Christ, how can you be at peace with Christ? Be at peace with your neighbors, at peace with everybody. Make sure that you are living a peaceful life, knowing that this world, you are, you are on a transit on earth. So if you haven't gotten to that stage, you are still a baby. You are still a child. No matter your age, you are in a stage that you still be at be a enmity with people you are easily you easily bear grudges you keep malice you are just like a fool i'm sorry to use that term but i just want to for you to understand you know at some point paul was telling the gentiles say who bewitched you you fool you foolish galatians who bewitched you you know so i want you to understand that you cannot be a christian except you follow the lifestyle of Christ. So it's very important at my stage in life now, the level I am in life, <clears throat> at my age, 
you know, and my knowledge of whom God is, I desire to make peace with anyone. Those that have wronged me, I forgive you from my heart. Those that I have wronged, knowingly or unknowingly, please forgive me. You know, so that's, that's the level I am in my lifetime now. I don't have room to bear grudges. So we have gotten to that stage that we have to preach this gospel the way it, is, it ought to be preached without having, without sugarcoating it, without diluting it to suit, you know, our, our greed. You know, because I once said, you can, you can use this word of God to deceive a lot of people. To monet you can monetize it easily, you know, by misinterpreting it in a way that it will suit your greed. But the end is what justifies the means. So, but today, it's important that this is end time. People should know what it is that you need to know to make internal life. What is it that you need to know to make internal life? And I'm going to be uh, reading from Luke. The first place I'm going to read is Luke chapter 10. A certain man asked Jesus in Luke chapter 10 from verse 25. I'm going to just cut it short and, and share the story because of time. Because I'm about rounding up the part one of this message. So it, it's about the parable of, of the good Samaritan. You know, somebody asked a straight up question to Jesus and said, you know, a lawyer, a certain lawyer came and uh, asked Jesus and, and said, um, what can I do? The man said, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? When you read verse 25 of Luke chapter 10, he says, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? It was a trick question. The man wasn't asking Jesus because he wanted to get the right answer. You know, these are, they were custodian of the law. You know, so they thought by asking him that, Jesus would contradict himself by speaking against the law that was given to Moses, a law that Moses made for them. But what they did not understand that Jesus is the law. The law that Moses made, the law that Moses misrepresented, the law was not meant for the people. The law was meant for Christ to fulfill. That's why Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill all the requirements of the law. So the law wasn't meant for me and you. No, the law wasn't meant for people. It was meant for Christ. It's a law that Christ must kept for us to have salvation. So Jesus reminded them, say, I came not to abolish it, not to contradict it, but to fulfill everything that was spoken, everything that was written in the law, I came to fulfill it. So they asked him this question. And Jesus says, he said to the, to to them, what is written in the law? Verse 26, say, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And in verse 27, uh, uh, the lawyer answered Jesus and said, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the key word. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, you can love the Lord, love everything. The law was loving God, loving God. But the question I have to ask you, because Jesus tried to fulfill it to them, how can you love God that you do not see? I, I feel like speaking in tongues right now. How can you love God you do not see and you keep malice with your neighbor? How? Because you say, oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I don't see Christ, but I see Christ in my neighbor, and I don't love my neighbor. How? It means I'm a hypocrite. That's why I said you get to a level that you have to comprehend the fact you must live at peace with everybody. I'm going to end the part one, so let's dive into part two. Hallelujah. Let's continue this message in part two. <coughs> Praise God. Welcome to the part two of this message. In part one, I ended it by asking us a question. Remember, in case if you if you didn't if you skipped the part one, please I want you before you listen to this message, look for the part one. But if you're watching on YouTube, you don't need to look for the part one because already I'm gonna compile it as one message on YouTube. But if you're listening to this message on Instagram or TikTok, I implore your honor with utmost humility to look for the part one so you can understand the content of this message. Now the lawyer asked Jesus, how can we inherit the kingdom of God? It was a trick question. 
But Jesus came not to contradict what was said in the Old Testament, what the prophets said, what the judges said, what the, the teachers said, what the priests said, but Jesus came to remind them that everything that was spoken in the, in the law of Moses was about him. It was something for him to fulfill. That was why Jesus was not, key, was, was not crucified because he sinned. No, he, he was crucified by the law of God. The law of God fought against the Son of Man. And that was the right thing because Jesus knew that the law wasn't meant for us. The law was meant for him to fulfill. They killed Jesus, the Sanhedrins, the, the chief priests, they crucified Jesus on the account that he, you know, that he came to, to, to uh, uh, speak against, he spoke against the law of God. He was so, they were so mad. He spoke against the law. He spoke against their uh, uh, patriots. He, they were so mad. So they were protecting the law. They killed him because they, were, they tried to protect the law. So you can see that the law of God fought against the Son of Man. The Son of God. The law of God fought against the Son of Man. And that is the contest Jesus knew. He says, I did not come to abolish your laws. I came to fulfill it. And by dying at that moment, he fulfilled the penalties of the law. The anger on which the law was written, the punishment that came with the law. But now, for all these things have been fulfilled, you have a role to play to make it eternal life, to inherit the kingdom of God. And when this lawyer asked Jesus this question, Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 to 37, but that we have read, uh, we are now in verse 25. In verse 26, okay, in verse 26, so he answered, <clears throat> what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And the lawyer responded to Jesus. So the lawyer said to Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus tried to remind them, you, you, do, not, you do not see your God. Even Jesus was there, they did not understand that Jesus was God at that point. But Jesus came as a neighbor, still they didn't like him. So how can you love God so much? How can you love God so much, but you despise your neighbor? How can you be so emotional when you pray to God, you cry, you get into the spirit, you speak in tongues, but you despise your child? You are at war with your child. You are at war with your neighbor. You are at war with your colleagues at, 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 with your colleagues at work. You are at war with everybody on social media. You are an attack dog to politicians on social media. You know, nobody's, when somebody speaks against your, your, your political affiliation, you, you can curse the person and say, but you're a Christian and you end up praying. You bully people on social media. You do all these things and you claim to love God, but you don't love those that you see. You disagree with them. There's something a president once a president of America said, Barack Obama, he said, we can disagree without being disagreeable. I love that. We can have some disagreement. I call it, we can have some constructive criticism without us hating each other. You can disagree with what I'm preaching without you attacking my personality. It's the context of the message. You can use the Bible scriptures to counter whatever I said without you cursing me out. But why we Christian? You can see two lawyers. They go before a judge to argue on argue uh, on a case based on the constitution, constitutional constitutionalities, <laughs> amen, of the matter. They base their argument on the constitution of that matter without fighting one another. They argue it on the basis of the law. They apply their point on the basis of the law. But when Christians have misunderstanding, wow, we don't use the scripture to air our views. We fight. We curse each other. We argue differently. Jesus said. And they wanted to know who is your neighbor. Your neighbor, rather. And in verse 28, and he, and, and he said to him, you have answered rightly. That's Jesus responding. Do this and you will live. But he, the man, 
wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? He said, Who is my neighbor? Then Jesus said, A certain man, he told them parable. You know, Jesus spoke in parable because the understanding was so porous at that time. So he wanted, he spoke in parables. You know, because he couldn't give the straightforward answer. It was, they had porous understanding. So Jesus used parables to bring it to their standard. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped, who stripped him of his clothes, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest, in verse 32, likewise a Levite. A Levite, these are like, the people that collect tithes back in those days is their duty to collect tithes because because they they, they we are the priests you know the, from the levites you, you get the priest so likewise a levite when he arrived at the place came and looked and passed by on the other side but a certain man the bible says but a certain samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion. He was moved with compassion. Verse 34 says, So he went to him and bandaged him, because the man was bleeding, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, that's his donkey, and brought him to an inn, that's a hotel, what we call hotels now, or motel, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? Jesus asked them in verse 37. They responded and said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to, the, to him, Go and do likewise. Brethren, go and do likewise. I, I love Jesus. Jesus said, go and be nice. You cannot be too nice to God. God you do not see. God that is invisible. The Bible says, he, God is a spirit. He who must worship him, must worship him in truth and in spirit. What is the truth? Truth is that, do unto your neighbor that which you would do unto God. Do unto your neighbor that you will do unto God. Or do unto God that which you will do unto your neighbor. You cannot be too righteous. Too righteous. You can't claim to be too righteous, but you are an angry freak. You keep malice. We are humans. Yeah, we can keep malice, but not to a fault. Somebody will ask you, I say, you can't, no peace for how many, some people have been have been in enmity for over decades, but they still pray to God. They still speak in tongues. Jesus says in verse thirty-seven, "Look, we are reading from now. We are looking, reading from Luke chapter 10, 25 to thirty-seven. He says, "Go." He told the man, "Go and do likewise." Now I'm going to give you the concluding part. Let us flip to part three of this message. I love Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Let's hit the part three of this message. <coughs> Amen. Welcome to the part 3 of this message. If you're watching me on Instagram and TikTok, this is the part 3 of this message. But if you're on YouTube and on Facebook, I believe this message will be compiled to be one full message. So you don't need to go into parts. Amen. I just want to make sure that everybody receive this undiluted gospel of truth. We are speaking of what you sh what, how can you receive eternal life? Inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus told the man you must love God, yes, but your neighbor is very paramount, very important. You show love to your neighbor because we, we love God so much, but our heart is filled with wickedness, envy, revenge, vengeance. No wonder the Bible says, for the blood of Abel was speaking for revenge. Speaking for revenge, but the blood of Jesus was speaking for mercy. Abel was speaking. Revenge my death. Revenge those that killed me. 
revenge it. But Jesus was speaking. Father, have mercy. Have mercy. So I wait for Jesus. If you are Christians, it means we have to emulate the lifestyle of Christ. Learn to forgive. But if you are not a Christian, then follow Abel's lifestyle. But I am a Christian because I want to make sure I inherit this kingdom of God. It may be my last time ministering the word of God to you. But my desire is not to be a fool on earth, deceiving myself preaching the gospel. And I, I, I lose the race. No, that's not my desire. So I've gotten to a stage in my life. What I desire now is to be at peace. Because not being at peace is the only thing that will deprive me of this. And I make sure I'm at peace. And I openly confess, if I wronged you, forgive me. And if you have wronged me, even without you asking me, I've forgiven you because I pray for you. I pray for those that love me and those that despise me. I have nothing against anyone. And I want you to do the same. There is, there is one thing we don't understand, the importance of doing good. A lot of celebrities will be in heaven because they do good. Because they, they, love, they show love to their neighbors. A lot of them have foundations. They use it to reach out to the poor, reach out to those in need. I want to, to do the same. You don't need to have foundations to be nice to people. Jesus told this man, he didn't tell this man, go and have foundation. He says, hey, be nice. The priest saw the man, the story about the good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, from verse 25 to 37. They despised him. But a Samaritan went and helped and gave his all to make sure that that man lived. That's how to serve God, brethren. That's how to serve God, not by praying and fasting alone. How to serve God is when you do this unto those neighbors in your community. Now, there was a man in the Bible called um, um, Dorcas, a woman rather called Dorcas. I want to share a story with you. This story touched my heart. Now, let's read, let's read uh, Acts chapter 9 from verse 36. And I want to read it quickly. I prayed for this to be the last uh, uh, part of this message. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. You see what the Bible says? Filled with good works and charitable deeds. But it happened in the, those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, washed her, they laid her in upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was, was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went to them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood up, weeping, showing tonics and garments, which Dorcas had made while she was with them. I'm having goosebumps as I was reading this. They were weeping, telling Peter why this woman shouldn't die untimely. Telling Peter you need to demonstrate the power of God unto salvation. This woman was helping the poor, helping the needy, taking care of the widows. And the good works of this woman was what inspired Peter for to pray. I'm rushing this message, but I just want you to understand the importance of doing good. Showing love to your neighbors. Those widows this woman helped We are not family members. Maybe she didn't have so much, but the little she had, she shared with those poor. But when she died, she died on timely death. She was sick and died. Perhaps she had no more money to treat herself of the medical condition she was passing through, that she had to die. But those she helped prayed for her, sought for her to come back to life, to continue her good deeds. Listen, how many people have you affected that are praying for you? Sometimes I don't pray. Trust me. Some, there are many times I don't pray. But there are so many prayer warriors that are praying for me. Those I never met in life. When I had my bed there, I read messages that made me cry. People I haven't met, but I touched their lives. A young lady that graduated, an orphan, she's now a nurse. We trained her. We paid her school fees. We took care of her personal needs. She wrote a letter that made me cry. I never, I met her once. This last time I went to Uganda, I, ran, I met her. For the first time, but the good work of Christ we did, 
this lady sent a letter that broke my heart and made me to cry. Can you imagine a grown man crying here in the United States because of a message I received. Acts of doing good inspired me to do more. Now see what happened when you read Acts of Apostle, chapter 10. I'm going to be very brief. I'm telling you a story about a man called Cornelius. It was a time that, the, the, you know, then it was God of the Israels. The Gentiles, it, it wasn't their God. They were segregating. The Israels were, the Jews were segregating. But there was a man, an Italian man, called Cornelius. See what the Bible, how the Bible de described this man. In Acts of Apostles chapter 10 from verse, from verse 1, the Bible says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. The Italian regiment, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms, listen, he said, who gave alms generously to the poor and prayed to God always. I will pause there. The Bible identified him as a man that gave generously to the poor. The importance of doing good. We preach this Bible in a manner that we misrepresent the facts about Christ. That's why there's so much hatred all over especially on, in, in global community called social media. So much hatred because people advertise healing. People advertise things that are not meant to advertise. People advertise, pastors advertise their ego. Nobody speak about the true and the only religion that God wants us to practice. James chapter 1 verse 27. The only religion that God wants us to practice in this global village we can practice this religion and make this world a better place. Jesus said, occupy it till I come. Take care of this. Brethren, love one another. <coughs> Jesus understands the importance of loving your neighbor. Your neighbor may not be your countryman. He may not be an American. He may not be an African. He may even be an Asian. He may even be an African in a different continent. Show that person love. Show that person love. It doesn't have to be a worshiper of Jesus. Your neighbor shouldn't even be a Christian for you to love the person. You can love an atheist. You can love a Buddhist. Imagine you're flying an airplane. You're traveling somewhere. And maybe you, you, you despise atheist a lot or Buddhist or whatever religion that is not yours. But you have a pilot who is flying you. He has flown for 30 years with a beautiful record to fly you. You have an opportunity to be flown by that pilot with experience who is an atheist. Or you can go with a Christian who has no experience, have had multiple accidents practicing how to fly. Who do you choose? Do you go with the Christian without experience because you are a bigot? Or do you go with the man with experience? Keep the answers to yourself. That is how it is when you want to do good. Be blind to bigotry and do good. That's what Jesus wants us to do. James chapter 1 verse 27. The only true religion. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that Anyone and everyone under the influence of your word will receive life and receive it more abundantly. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that let us go and practice the act of kindness as a means of spreading the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I love you. Until I see you next time. It's me, your brother, Apostle, Sir Henry Xavier. Shalom.